Are you in Los Angeles now? I just got here two days ago. I was in Vegas when the whole thing was coming down and I just went, you know what, this is going to be bad. If the world's going to lock down, I should go home to where my family is and not burden the American health system. And um, so I did and the whole world closed down. So you spent quarantine in New Zealand. What's happened is New Zealand gets one case and they shut the country down because we can't afford, our health system is so small, we are only 5 million people. So we have a very fragile economy around healthcare because it's socialized medicine. So they locked down hard and thank God they did. And you know what happened? The economy boomed after that. Out of trying to hit off disaster at the get-go, the government went and green lit all these um, construction projects, which was kind of nightmarish because there's road cones all over the world, especially if you're trying to film in the urban environment. Pain in the ass, but jump-started the economy. Plus, all of a sudden, people start embroidering their lives inwards instead of spending $40,000 on a trip to Italy. They go and spend a hundred grand on their house. We are shocked how much money is in the country. So everybody's working. It was the right decision to make to sort of respect the flow, respect the science, and um, being a what they call the team of five million. Like it's very cohesive, pretty much. It'd be like Norway or anywhere. You know, they they can band together to do things. I think anyway, it was a wise move, and it really paid off. That's incredible. I've always been impressed with New Zealand. But I do want to tell you, I was rejected, banned, actually. No. Do you mind my telling you? Uh, please tell me. All right. So I was shooting Yogi Bear 3D in your beautiful country. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of remember now you mentioned, yeah. And shooting in 3D takes an incredibly long time. So we were there for, I think, five and a half months. And it was fantastic. We stayed in Auckland. We shot every day in a forest outside of town. At Wood Hill, yeah. Yeah, I think we went to Lake Tapout. Topo, yeah. Yes. And I had a fabulous time. I made new friends. I ate wonderful food. It was a fantastic place to be shooting. When I came back, and it was time after a year to promote the movie, I went on a show that is now no longer called The George Lopez Show. Oh, yeah, I know, yeah. And you know how on talk shows you have to bring some kind of amusing story. Shtick? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really bad at it. I was in Auckland one night. I went to a concert, like some of the cast were going and whatever. So we went out. I left early and I was walking back from the concert to my hotel, which was probably a half a mile. And I had my backpack on and it was like maybe 10 o'clock at night and a car full of boys drove past and they sh said, show us your tits. And I was like, oh, that hasn't happened in a while. <laughs> I know, that's like stuck in the 70s. I don't know. It was more amusing than anything. So I told this story on the George Lopez show. And the minister of tourism at the time made an announcement. I got a formal letter that I was no longer welcome in New Zealand. No. Yes. And then it became the Auckland... The Heralds. They made a story out of it because, yeah. There was a woman there, an editor, who defended me and wrote an op-ed piece. And then other women wrote in. So I had this nice little group of support. So I wrote a letter and I called into a local radio show and I said, I love your country and I would love to be welcomed back. Let's have a little bit of unvarnished truth so we can all get down with reality and grow, right? Yeah. I said, you know, well, we have plenty of bozos here, too. Guys like that, I would say, are obviously completely uncouth and they are a throwback. I must say, I don't get that kind of reaction. <laughs> I don't know if I would anymore either. You know, it was after a concert. <laughs> but how disgusting that, that young women should be exposed to this. And um, yeah, sorry, that's just, uh, I feel ashamed and yet not surprised. Oh, no, I was amused and I thought it would be a fine story for the George Lopez show. I didn't realize, I guess, the, the vocalization of the story would be offensive as well. <laughs> well, I'm going to plead uh, Frank Zappa on that. There is nothing that you can say. No words, especially if you're speaking truth, it can be objectively offensive. It's very subjective and um, you can only speak your truth. And I say go for it because um, right thinking people want to get down with reality. And that means you have to hear it. You have to hear things that are uncomfortable. How much did your own personality and Xena marry into each other? 
Well, I didn't think anything. You know, I never took myself very seriously as a human being. You know, I didn't think I was a grown up. You know how you don't feel like you're a grown up until it's like too late? <laughs> like suddenly at 50, you go, holy <laughs> shit, is that creepy skin? You go, I better start taking myself seriously, right? So I always thought, oh, well, it's just, I'm just saying the words that the writers give me and they're dressing me the way that the designer dresses me and the makeup is somebody else's work. So I felt like a very small part of the work. And then about seven years ago, I was being interviewed by somebody, by friends actually, in another country where I had to be completely, I wasn't selling. Do you know what I mean? I was really figuring out something. For the first time, I realized, oh my God, I was an important part of that because as an actor, all that data, the words and the clothing and the action and everything has to be run through your nervous system and your history. And it comes out in a way that is very unique to you. So I realized that it was <laughs> quite a lot to do with me, just as Renee's character, Gabrielle, was everything about her and her nervous system and her body and her history brought life to that. So, yeah, I guess there was more, I was more to do with it than I ever thought. I mean, every time I play a character, it, it does change me a little bit, I think, hopefully for the better. That's interesting. Yeah. Specifically, when I think about this, I think about playing Shelly in The House Bunny. My character has an absolute heart of gold, really wants the best for people, and is not competitive in a typical female sense, I guess. And I really loved feeling that way. And it made me feel like I changed, it changed my relationships with women in Hollywood, I think. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was really nice. Was that because you could drop all cynicism and all insecurity that sort of breeds cynicism? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that it was also the realization that envy and jealousy was just not very productive and like... Letting go of that early 20s feeling where, God, she's hotter than I am. She's going to get the role, you know, whatever. Fear. She's taller. She's just more beautiful. Yeah. 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 And that was really liberating. I want to ask you, do you feel like your fan base is slightly different and more passionate? And did fans help keep the show continuing? Because in my my memory, it was almost like Star Trek a bit, Xena where you have incredibly loyal fans who feel very passionately about the characters and the storylines and are opinionated and ultimately help the show succeed. Yeah. Would that be a correct assessment? Yeah. I think the difference in timbre between fan bases, and I, I haven't been inside the Star Trek fan base. They're, they're very cohesive, as is the Xena fan base, very cohesive. And then every other, uh, Stargate, all these sort of, things that you see at uh, conventions, right, have massive, very well-defined fan bases. And um, what was very particular about our one is that because the show had this ethos of the greater good, you act in line with the greater good, they either naturally self-selected into that messaging or they began to embody it and doing acts of kindness out in their own communities. So, yes, there was a real kind of an unspoken spoken conversation, a deal between the show and the fan base. And it was about being part of something greater, more important than yourself and living kindness and paying forward and all that sort of stuff. So I think that there was a deal between us, a covenant. And as somebody once told me, if you stick with the fans, they'll stick with you. And that seems to be true. And um, yeah, honor them. You don't have anything without them. Lucy, I love how you put that, the covenant that's beautiful. Well, thank you. Okay. Lucy, if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be? I'm a sucker for Italy or France. Me too. Yeah. Where in Italy? I don't know. I mean, I've been all over. I haven't um, spent much in Marche. I really like down Apulia is the heel of Italy, like oh, mint. I love the people in the south, a little friendlier, but um, also, oh my God, if you go up to Piedmont, right, Alba, it looks like Shrek. I swear to God, there's car sort of castly buildings and it's just the little town hall, you know. It's Shrek land. This really exists. That's where all those fairy tale images come from. Little turreted buildings and pointy roofs and things. So would, would we send you to Puglia or, Apulia? or Alba? Um, I know more people. I know more people in the north. Well, Positano, I've got lots of friends there. Why are you going to send me there? That's marvellous. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by Best Fiends. For those of you who think that Best Fiends is just a really fun and challenging puzzle game with over 100 million downloads, I'm here to tell you that Best Fiends can save your life. Imagine you're on a road trip, your significant other is driving, and you're on that stretch of the I-5 with a lot of cows and no cell service. Your chair is becoming more uncomfortable by the minute, and every time you check the GPS, the nearest hotel is still two hours away. If you've learned anything from true crime podcasts, you know that you probably won't survive the night at a rest stop, but that poorly chosen audiobook could kill you just as well. Then, in a moment of clarity, you realize you have everything you need to survive. You don't even need Wi-Fi. All you need is your best fiends. Best Fiends is endless fun with great music, bright colorful visuals, engaging stories, cool collectible characters, and literally thousands of challenging puzzles to solve. It's the perfect game for grown-ups, and you can play anytime, anywhere, and according to the GPS, you'll be at your hotel much sooner than you thought. So download the five-star rated puzzle game, Best Fiends Free, today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Do you have a favorite movie that you watch over and over, say, on a rainy day or a sick day? I do. I just watch The Godfathers. I hate to be, like, completely conventional here, but any time The Godfather's on, I cannot stop watching it. First two Godfathers are the most perfect examples of filmmaking that I have ever found. Would you mind elaborating on that a little bit? This is the first time we've gotten Godfather. Oh, my God, the beauty, the art direction, the lighting, the acting, the... Yeah, the casting. Uh, you know what it is? It's that often in war movies or very male-centric stories, it is what we now term the male gaze. It's the who, what, where. And that's why it leaves a lot of us. It's really lacking for us because there is no, what's the underbelly? What's the subtext? What's the emotional journey of each character? What's the emotional intersection? What's the cost? What's the moral peril, right? This has been written. Mario Puzzo and Francis Ford Coppola wrote these characters to intersect so beautifully. It's not what they say. It's it's how everybody's saying everything and you're watching everybody's fortunes rise and fall in the same scene, right? That's the way they frame it. One person's up and the other's down. So you get all that tension in the characters and the drama. So you as the audience are just immensely rewarded every moment. It's got beautiful symbolism all the characters, the way they set it up. So it's not like very often in movies you're like watching the set up in a very sort of, oh, yeah, okay, well, she's going to die in the end in order to get, you know, you start plotting that sort of thing. You, it's so elegantly done in The Godfathers that um, it unfolds seamlessly and even after, I don't know, 30-something years of watching it, I'm experiencing it fresh and without judgment. I'm not trying to, mm-hmm. like, second-guess it every moment. It, that's how perfect, and that's the organic journey he takes you on. So it has um, the female gaze, I suppose, it is accounted for and is woven into the um, experience. That is a beautiful answer. Hey, you can have it. And thank you. What was your first boss like? My first boss, funnily enough, her name was Lawless. This is before I got married to the person called Lawless. No relation, though I did meet on the same job. I was underage working in a nightclub and people thought I was too haughty to pick up my, they'd throw like $50 notes on. I'd just bend down really elegantly, pick it up and just go on with my day. <laughs> that would have been like 19... 19- Good job! 1986. Oh, my God, that must have been a blast, was it? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's your first year at university and you're making some money in a fancy nightclub. Can I ask you what your first love was like? My first boyfriend? Yeah, when you thought to yourself at that age, I am in love. Oh, I was 13 and I saw this guy at the bus stop after school and I was like, I'm going to go out with him. And he was maybe two years older and I was like, I'm going to go out with him. I love him. He's beautiful. And it took me three years, but I did go out with him for a couple of years. My next question is your worst heartbreak. Yeah, no, it hasn't really happened. I was always ready to move on, (laughs) if ever I moved on. Really? Yes. Oh, my God. In those days, as soon as I started going out with somebody, I'd go, oh, my God, how am I going to get rid of it? You know, like, eventually it's going to end, and and how am I going to do it? (laughs) Yeah. So what did you do? How did you break up? No, actually, he was the one to end that one, but I was like, totally down. Maybe I was too chicken to call it, to be honest with you. He called it and I went, you're right. Thank you very much. (laughs) Bye-bye. So then are you in a relationship now? Do you mind my asking? Uh, Yes, I've been married for 25 years. 
So much for my careful research, Lucy. <laughs> it's okay. I never, never, never talk about it. Oh, okay. I never talk about, you know, my family or anything, but seldom. That's how you keep alive, right? Don't talk about it. Yeah. Because it calls too much focus on it, even for yourself. I, I remember some people who would get on giving, like, dating advice. <laughs> you remember Kim Cattrall and her husband wrote a book. Um, a few other people would do dating advice. It's like, your marriage is over the minute you start doing <laughs> Because you put too much focus even on your own marriage. I mean, honestly, in a relationship, you got to let shit go. The minute you start freaking having to sort it out and be honest about everything, it's over. There's a certain amount of glamour in the old-fashioned sense of the word, like smoking fucking mirrors to staying in a relationship. And that means you don't have to hash everything out. Some shit, just let it go. You've got better things to think about, like raising your kids and paying the mortgage and whatever. I love that. Yeah, yeah, just look, girlfriend, <laughs> here's my advice. The best way to win a tug of war sometimes is to let go the rope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you don't have to win every argument or even let somebody else win. Just ah, move on, keep moving. Lucy, what personality traits did you inherit from your parents? I grew up in a culture of service. So I did inherit that probably more than my brothers. So I've got five brothers and one sister. And yeah, no, I'm probably the only one who got it. So we are community minded. And I don't mean that I go, to, I don't go to PTA things. I don't go to the school pub quiz or any of that. But your life is about service. That's a big part of being alive. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Is that a personality trait? I think it is because it, it's a certain amount of openness to other people and their experience and not feeling threatened by their vulnerability, by their need, by their whatever, you know. Did you grow up with, I assume, empathy towards others? Yeah, yeah, lots of that. And also when the big apartheid struggle was on uh, in South Africa, we, they would have the rugby team come and play in New Zealand and would play in our town. My father was the mayor. So we had death threats leveled against them, you know, we'll blow up your house and all this stuff. I'm home from school going, oh, shit, mama, they're going to come and blow up our house. And my father was like pro sport. He wanted the football to come. It's just a football town. My mother and half the country were like, no, this is about apartheid. It's about right and wrong. So it was in every New Zealand house, this conversation, this fight was being had. So it, it makes you sensitive. Lucy, what happened? Did they come and did they play? Oh, they came and there was huge riots and the South African protesters, because um, I now know some of them, back in South Africa were so heartened to see all these white people in another country who gave a shit about what was happening in Soweto and South Africa. It, you know, it was a huge boon to them and encouraging that people who didn't look like them from a long way away really cared and were putting their uh, life and liberty on the, on the line. And ultimately, yes, the, the apartheid regime fell. So um, I guess the point of that, uh, even though my father was by no means would support apartheid or anything, they, there was a dissociation between the sports and the need to compete and, and morality, as we see here, right? And um, I applaud that. They're not standing up with a gun shooting the shit out of a bunch of people at a thing in Vegas to make their point. All they are doing is taking a knee and um, expressing it as is their right as a human. I think just because you're a sports star doesn't take away your right to take a stance that hurts no one. I'm in complete agreement. Lucy, what is a trait you dislike in others? Lack of curiosity. I abhor that. Failure of curiosity. Yeah, just like, oh my God, you're dead already. Here you go. It's a simple answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. Okay, what is a trait you dislike in yourself? Oh, scratching my head here. I have no filter, which has been a little bit of a problem at times. You know what? The truth is I've had enough head knocks to have been through some concussions and that has caused me real problems because I'm quite an unfiltered person generally. But if you have concussions, it can cause you to act in ways that are completely, you just have a brownout of your processing and um, that's been quite embarrassing at times. You know, people just have a perfect right to think that I'm a complete nincompoop and, and awful and all this stuff. But I must say, since I've had <laughs> help for my head trauma. I'm so glad yeah. you recognize that, though. I think it's easy with any kind of brain injury to ignore it. Well, you don't know. You don't know because it's happening to you. It's in your brain. Nobody can see it. So everybody goes, oh, you're fine. There's no blood. There's no bump on your head. But God knows what's going on in there. And um, 
a life like mine, there's been quite a lot of knocks. So not to the Aaron Hernandez degree or anything like that, or or I'm sure OJ Simpson, you know, we're starting to understand brain trauma and, and what it does to personality. But I've had over the span of more than a decade, I've had quite some episodes and it's really kind of embarrassing looking back. But you know what? I'm better now and um, you just have to let stuff go. But that impulsivity and, and lack of impulse control has been in the past a bit of a pain in the ass. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by Vital Farms Eggs. With so many options to choose from, it can be difficult to know which brands you can trust. Vital Farms works directly with small, family-run farms committed to the ethical treatment of animals and the land on which they're raised. Hens have outdoor access year-round, happily spending their days doing things that hens like to do with 108 square feet of sunny space per hen. That's 90 times more space than a cage-free hen. Even better, those spacious pastures are free of herbicides and pesticides because healthier land means healthier, happier hens. And happy hens are where delicious quality eggs come from. In fact, if you enter the farm name from your Vital Farms egg carton on traceability, you can actually see the pasture. So grab a carton of Vital Farms eggs the next time you're at the grocery store and start feeling confident about where your food comes from. Go to vitalfarms.com to learn more. Vital Farms, where honest food is raised. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by Mosey Baby. Mosey Baby are the makers of the Mosey Kit, which is a groundbreaking home insemination product that's safe, simple, affordable, and much more romantic than a doctor's office. Of course, you can always play doctor while leaving the whole conception part to Mosey. The Mosey Kit is clinically proven to be as effective as IUI for conception, but if you are familiar with IUI and IVF, you know that these procedures can cost tens of thousands of dollars. At only $89, each Mosey Kit includes a collection cup, educational instructions, and two Mosey syringes, the first and only syringes designed specifically for baby making. They are as comfortable and familiar as using a tampon, work with fresh or frozen sperm, and ensure you make the most of each try. Mosey also has ovulation predictor kits and pregnancy tests, everything you need discreetly delivered to your door. Check out their instructional videos, educational articles, and real stories from the Mosey community for inspiration to start your journey. Mosey Baby has already helped thousands of families on their path to parenthood. Ready to make a baby? Visit moseybaby.com slash Anna to get 15% off your first Mosey Baby purchase. That's M-O-S-I-E baby.com slash Anna for 15% off your first purchase and start your family on your own terms today. What talent or ability would you most like to have if you didn't have to work for it? (laughs) If I didn't have to work for it. Yeah, I was going beyond talent and ability and straight to superstardom as an opera singer or something. Um, If I didn't have to work for it, I think to play the guitar, you know, beautifully, or violin or something, like virtuosity would be terrific. What intimidates you? Now I can say not very much. I'm a little little intimidated by the prospect of being in the COVID world because this is new for me. I've been in a free-moving society till three days ago. This is quite intimidating. The future's intimidating. I'm quite distressed to see the changes in Los Angeles, even over the last year. And prior to that, I was distressed then to see the metastasis of Skid Row all over the city and um, and the quality of the trash and treasure and the burned out sofas at off ramps in Hollywood. Um, It doesn't do to say tent city. It's beyond that. It's mounds of filth and degradation and desolation of the soul. You can see these. I don't know. This must be on your mind because you did bring up, in terms of personality traits from your parents, the first thing you said was acts of service, essentially. And it's too overwhelming, I think. Yeah. There's a feeling of helplessness because how does it get solved? Yes, exactly. What I'm thinking in regards to that, because actually doing something about it actually soothes your soul a little bit, no matter what it is. You get a little bit active. And um, I've been thinking about the concept of bearing witness as part of service and, you know, just to go out. I want to film some little things <laughs> that are a little bit satirical because here we have Whitey on the moon 
and uh, planning to go to the moon and, you know, like, let's build a tent city on Mars. I'm going to film those fucking car parks where I used to park in Los Angeles and, and pretend it's Jeff Bezos setting up tent city in, on the moon because it looks like on in Mars. That's what it looks like. It's like, Jeff, come here, bro. Come and see what's going on in your own backyard. We have we have Mars right here. But sadly, it's all too real. And I'm really deeply shocked because I am a bit empathic and I'm, maybe I'm just conjuring this, you know, but Los Angeles is just lacking in joy. Los Angeles has always ridden along on this bit of effervescence, right, and sparkle and um, energy and the exchange of ideas. Well, that's just, it's like a souffle that has fallen and I feel the loss of the Los Angeles that I used to know, right, and maybe that's happened over and over in history. I, I'm in the middle of just sort of processing that at the moment. I don't think that Los Angeles was ever, ever felt like a home, but it feels like I am riding on the exodus wave as well. Like the sense of optimism that even if it was sort of paper thin, it was there and it just don't feel that quite as much. Lucy, what was your first kiss like? I was, I think, 11 years old and his name was Reed. And I seem to remember that his breath smelled of pool water. <laughs> That's funny, eh? Hey? He had breath like pool water. Not the worst. <laughs> Would you consider yourself an early bloomer? By no means. No, I was quite late, actually. Me too. It was tough then. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> holy Mary, will I ever get my I period? <laughs> when is my chest going to grow? Yeah. And it didn't. So <laughs> I went to Dr. Teitelbaum <laughs> when I was 30. I was going through my first divorce, and I was like, I'm going to get my boobs done. <laughs> but you'd had a baby, right? No, not yet. Oh, you hadn't? How many divorces have you had? Two. Wow, you banged through them. 44, yeah. You don't have to marry them. You just go out with them for a little <laughs> while, you fool. Well, it just took me a minute to find the right one. <laughs> Maybe you're just a romantic. I am. Always have been. What advice would you give your younger self? I would love to say it. And I do tell young people this now, like, and they say, oh, you know, I don't feel ready for this. I'm like, God, welcome to adulthood, kid, because you're never going to feel more grown up than you do right now. This is it. You know, you're waiting for some change for you to feel. But trust me, you're 53 before that bloody comes on you, you know. So just realize all the adults out there, they don't know what they're doing either. They're just bloody making it up as they go along, trying to blind you with confidence. So welcome to grown up life, kids. You are an adult. This is it. <laughs> And then I would have taken myself a little more seriously, you know. I just always, I was just sort of really being a dilettante, sort of flitting on to this. And like I've always been a little jellyfish. I'll go here, I'll be here. If I took myself more serious, I would have perhaps identified what I love, what excites me, what what's meaningful to me, and like stuck to that instead of just jellyfishing along. Do you think you have a more solidified answer in that now? Well, I do, but it has coincided with my kids don't need me anymore. And this is a time in life which is quite beautiful, actually, as suddenly at 50 years old, you get a surge of energy because nobody else has first call on your brain or your body or your heart or anything anymore. It's like, it's all you. And you're like, I'm off to the races. It's very, very exciting. It should be. And my mother told me when I was just a kid, like, make sure you as a woman keep something for yourself as your kids are growing up, because otherwise you're going to be left bereft. Their job, child's job is to grow up and leave you. And you have to have developed something of yourself to go on with because the empty nest thing is real. It really happens. It's a devastating, but it can be devastating for two days or two weeks or two years, but you don't want it to be two years. So make sure you keep developing your own thing, you know. How old are your kids now? My youngest is 19 and my oldest is 33. And I have a 21-year-old. Um, they're all in New Zealand this week, but my two sons, the younger ones, are off to college here in America in the next over the next month. So I'm here to shepherd kids to college. And I dropped the girlfriend of one of them on a plane yesterday uh, to where she needs to be. And uh, yeah, so I'm doing the college, the college run. Do you like the girlfriend of one of them? Adore. Oh, good. I do. I love, I love both the girlfriends. Yeah. And the boyfriend of the other. Because nobody gets married. <laughs> what a gift you give your children by adoring them, you know? Oh, yeah, I trust my kids to pick great people. And um, if I didn't love them, I wouldn't say anything anyway. Because I've been a daughter-in-law. It's a tough gig, you know. It's tough to meet the sisters for the first time and, and 
I had one very welcoming mother-in-law and one judgy and um, threatened and, you know, that whole thing. And uh, I'd rather be the other one. Were you married before your... Yes, I am an anomaly. I was married at 19 years old to, um, that's where I got the name Lawless. Prior to that, I was Ryan. So, yeah. Getting married at 19, that's a bold move. Yes, well, I was a very headstrong girl and thought, and I was very in love and uh, I, and pregnant. <laughs> so it just seemed like the thing to do. Not as a Kiwi, but I was raised Catholic and I just thought that's what we should do. In being raised Catholic, did you have a lot of guilt around sex? Yeah, that's why there was no contraception because, you know, sex is inevitable, but contraception is an option and you shouldn't take it. <laughs> I've changed the script on that for my kids. The second they two are of age, it's like, bam, see that box of condoms? <laughs> I was raised without religion, but it was so important to my mom that I remain a virgin. Sex was, I think, because she had had such a rough childhood oh, oh, and she has mm. two sisters. They were all poor. They were all beautiful. I mean, they're all still alive, but, yeah. <laughs> but a really abusive, suppressive Ugh. household that they all couldn't wait to leave. But they did pass on to their kids this very tricky relationship with sex. And when I first started having sex with my first boyfriend, I was in high school. I was 17, and I knew that if my mom found out, that I would have to, like, probably leave the house. I'd have to go live with a friend. Oh, you poor thing. That's awful. It was really rough. Because, of course, she found out. Of course she knows. Like, I would come home with my shirt on inside out or, you know, <laughs> whatever. Like, <laughs> Yeah. No, I let my kids sleep with their partners in the house because I want them to be safe. I want them to be open. And, I mean, God forbid that they should actually be safe and have fun. Right? I know. I want them to enjoy their sexuality and to do it safely and respectfully and, yeah, instead of in cars, like, shamefacedly like we did. So, yeah, I don't have those hang-ups. Lucy, can you tell us other intelligent things that you have adopted in child-rearing? No, I'm out. <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, I wouldn't know what no, to say. I, I will say that the one thing that I'm really pleased with looking back, the best thing that we ever did is to respect our kids' individuality because if you try to make your kids an extension of yourself, it's disrespectful to them as, as humans and it's harmful and, um, yes, stifles their development. So um, you always get such an interesting human being when they're fully self-realized and everything. They're passionate and they're go-ahead and... and um, and they're living an authentic life, that's that's the human being you want to have as your kin. Yeah. Lucy, do you have a favorite book or author? Yes. Okay, I don't know why I picked this book. It was on the top 50 greatest books of all time. I was like, that's a really, like, anodyne, boring name. What the hell is that? Why would a book called Pale Fire be on the top? And it was Nabokov. I'd never read Nabokov. And, by the way, some of his books are just impenetrable. I can't get them at all. They're too esoteric and weird. But this book... <laughs> is the strangest, most genius. There's a, an audio version of it, which is freaking mind-bendingly great. Until now, the greatest narrator on Audible is like Jeremy Irons is insurpassable, in my opinion, except by this one recording of Pale Fire. These people who managed to elevate great writing to even better by dramatizing it, like, oh my God. You're making me want to read it. Or, I don't know, at least listen to it. Okay, so we started to talk about this last year in quarantine. Can you tell me more about your experience? It's a little bit like I was saying with the New Zealand economy. You can't spend your currency elsewhere. You spend it at home. And the same with your attention, right? You're not focusing it on some dream outside your own horizon, which may indeed be your 100-foot apartment. So you start to embroider your life inwards and make things richer and develop you know, find out how to do things on YouTube and bake bread or whatever. So you are actually spending all that currency on yourself. I mean, that's if you're lucky enough to have a safe environment to live in. Be bloody hell for a lot of families out there. But, um, yes, yeah, so I have been working down on my little farm, which is spending a lot of time with the earth and planting trees with my son and fighting blackberry and uh, trying to get the dog not to eat possums because they get a ball of claw in their tummy and they can't poop for a month and then it's oh, it's all bad. It's all bad. Um, <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay, let me tell you the possum story. So every night, figured out he's a city dog, right? And he's quite young and he goes to the country and he goes, holy shit, look at the size of that rat. And he drives this thing up, it's a possum, up in a tree. And then he, he's just there barking, going, woof, woof, like you guys, come and look at this. Oh my God, come and look at this. And so my son comes along and gets the slug gun and he shoots it down because they're a terrible pest. The dog runs off with it and eats the whole damn thing, right? It must weigh, mm, let's say two kilos. So I don't know, is that six pounds, six, seven pounds of fluff and claw and the next day we tell the local farmers and they're like oh my god you're not supposed to let the the dog eat the possum like that he goes you got to cut the feet off before you give it to the possum i'm like i'm not gonna cut the freaking feet off a possum to give it to him well the next night dog successfully drives another possum up a tree and uh my boy comes along shoots it down and the dog doesn't want to eat it and we're like good he's learned not to eat those things so the night after that drives another possum up the tree my son shoots it and this one he decides to eat it must have been wrong something wrong with the second one he just knew but it makes dogs city dogs smell like bush meat like they've been eating monkeys or something right it's so horrible the way they smell after they've been eating animals like that Ugh. and they they can't poop and it all comes out and fluff and like goo and like all the textures oh anyway so I guess the take-home is you're supposed to cut the feet off a possum before you feed it to your dog, just FYI. <laughs> oh, my God. Lucy, will you tell us about My Life is Murder? Yeah, I got tired of making things that were full of sex and violence. This is, um, say, 2017 maybe, and I felt the world was in a pretty dark place. People were very stressed, 2017, if you remember. And I had this girl approach me. You want to make a, a girl's murder show? And I went... You know what? I like the cut of your jib, young woman. Come on, let's do it. Nobody might come to our party, but I'm feeling like to do a show that is vibrant, like really colourful and beautiful, this little pseudo family and where everything works out good at the end, like the murder gets solved. There's this sense of justice and comfort at the end. Like, I think I want to make that for me. This is pro-COVID, right? So we made it. And then this little show, which we shot in beautiful Melbourne, Australia, became far more successful than anybody might have dared to dream, you know, because I think the world just got even darker with COVID. And to have that little shot of beauty and tourism and family and goodness and something getting solved at the end of it, some justice, was balm for the soul. So I, I think, it, you know, in a hideous way, there was some sort of synchronicity there. Then when COVID hit Melbourne, Australia, very hard indeed, I was like, let's make it in my hometown because I'm excited to bring people to Auckland. And it's on Acorn, right? It's on Acorn on August 30. And um, yeah, you can get Acorn all over the world now. And they, they do a lot of, like, murder is their business. They're murder ink kind of thing for <laughs> people who love that kind of stuff. And it's, But satisfying murder. Well, it's all different. There's cold, bloody Scandinavian murder and there's um, warm down under murder and there's <laughs> true crime and there's all kinds of things. So if you like murder, if you like justice and or murder, we got you covered. I can't wait. I'm very excited. This does feel like the kind of show that we need right now. Yeah, it's just fun. It's very lighthearted too. It's uh, kind of doesn't take itself too seriously. Lucy, who would you invite to your dream dinner party? Other than you? Yes, thank you. You're the only one who's invited me so far. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I would invite a bunch of war correspondents and like fire department and detectives. They All those people who have the best war stories and to tell you what... The world is really like because, you know, with these like war correspondents, you know, you see them on CNN or whatever and they've got their ties on everything. You don't realize that two weeks ago they were having their car filled with bullets by some guy out of a sunroof in the desert pulling up next to you and riddling their car with bullets. Like these people live lives that we can't even fathom. It's a little bit like this car ball, you know, people holding onto the plane. These people have been there over and over and over again, and their war stories are really fascinating. I feel very much for them. They suffer a lot to bring us the news. It is always of particular pain and poignancy to read when a photojournalist or a, a correspondent has been killed or missing. Yeah. Yeah. I keep thinking about the first answer that you gave about personality traits inheriting from your parents, that you inherited this sense of service, this sense of proactivity. I think that's a reaction to it because 
if you don't be proactive, you just are in this puddle of frustration and despair. And by getting active, you actually relieve yourself of some of that because then your actions are in line with your beliefs. It's that peace that you seek. So I don't feel peaceful unless I'm, I mean, ultimately it's self-serving because you want to feel better. You know, we only do things because it serves us. Um, and my nervous system is very stressed if I'm not trying to square things up with myself. What do you do to relieve stress? Oh, I just run away to the farm and I plant trees. Something very organic and very physical and see the fruit of my labors right there. What do you grow on your farm? We're planting a bunch of trees, um, some American chestnuts, because I want to say 400 billion, but they can't be 400 billion. It must be 40 billion. American chestnuts went extinct since like 1940. Like in 70 years, went extinct in America. What happened to your tree? They, got, they all got a fungus, right? So that's a, such a massive loss of biomass and your heritage. So we have some exemplars from 100 years ago that were planted in New Zealand, and they're really great. Um, there's some very important oak DNA and um, chestnuts and all the stuff that we are a nursery for. Wow. And then will you ship the trees elsewhere? How does that work? Acorns, you can. I mean, I'm not sure what nobody in America seems to be clamoring for chestnuts, though you should be, because that's great wood it's, and it's, it's your heritage. I think possibly the fungus is still in the ground, so may, maybe it's impossible. I don't know. But we're growing them, if you ever want some. I do. They're beautiful trees. How fantastic that you have been able to preserve and then cultivate. Yeah. That is beautiful. I would love some. Okay, deal. Lucy, I can't thank you enough for talking with me. My pleasure. Lovely to know you at last. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I will. You too, doll. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Bye, Lucy. Ta-da. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by Vital Farms. Right now, I'm making a classic French omelet with three eggs, some Gruyere cheese, and chives. It sounds simple, but I like being able to taste all of the ingredients, especially the eggs. One of the first things you notice about a Vital Farms egg is the deep orange yolk. Actually, that's not true. The first thing you notice is the difference when cracking the shell of a Vital Farms egg. Unlike other less amazing eggs, the shell of a Vital Farms egg holds together. You don't have to dig out all the little pieces or, in my case, convince yourself that no one will notice a little crunch. I've already added about two tablespoons of olive oil to a pan and I'm heating it over medium high heat. It's important to not overheat the oil or your eggs will be too hard. I add half a tablespoon of Vital Farms butter to the eggs and another half tablespoon to the pan. All right, now it's time to add the eggs. I kind of move a fork through the eggs until they are about 75% cooked, then smooth down the surface with the back of a spoon or small spatula. Add a dash of salt and pepper. Then sprinkle on the shredded cheese and fresh, finely chopped chives. Now I'm covering the pan with a lid, turning off the heat and allowing it to cook. I'll be back in two minutes. Oh, it smells so good. Okay, now you tilt the pan a bit and carefully ease the omelet out of the pan and onto a plate. I'm using a rubber spatula for this part. Now roll the omelet into the traditional tube shape and sprinkle the top with more chives. This looks amazing. I wish you could see it. Vital Farms works directly with small family-run farms committed to the ethical treatment of the animals and the land on which they're raised. Hens have outdoor access year-round, happily spending their days doing things that hens like to do with 108 square feet of sunny space per hen. That's 90 times more space than a cage-free hen. So grab a carton of Vital Farms eggs the next time you're at the grocery store and start feeling confident about where your food comes from. Go to vitalfarms.com to learn more. Vital Farms, where honest food is raised. Thank you, dear listeners. Your support of our sponsors supports and qualified. Hey, 
Hey everyone, April Beyer is back now officially as my much needed co-host. As you know from previous episodes, April brings great advice, insight, and years of experience. I am so thrilled to have her. So tell us what's going on, Vanessa. I have been divorced, well, separated and divorced now, right, for two years. And, you know, my last relationship was scary for me because I saw a lot of traits that I saw when I was 17, dating my high school sweetheart, right, where I became very insecure, jealous. With my high school sweetheart, he was very charismatic and a lot of people would take it as him being flirtatious and he was very handsome and an athlete. And I think because his sisters would always tell me that I just wasn't good enough for him, I built a lot of insecurities. And moving forward, um, you know, I got remarried and I started feeling a lot of those insecurities with my husband and um, it became too much for him. And he decided to leave our marriage. And I mean, the way that he did it just he sent me an email. I was at work. I read the email and he was gone back to his country. And so I come home to an empty house. The thing was that he was already kind of warning me that things were just getting too much for him and he couldn't handle it. And then, you know, he was giving me heads up that he was thinking of leaving. I'm not mad that he decided to end the marriage because I understand. But for me, I think, you know, I I just turned 40 and I just feel like I just can't get my life together, you know? And um, back at my mom's house and, you know, I have no savings and it's just... I'm sorry, Vanessa, that sounds stressful. So that's where I'm at. And I mean, you know, a little bit of me does want to get out there and date, but I know I'm not ready. And I feel like I have like a lot of baggage going into a relationship, you know, that I don't even know how to address. I think the two things that I flagged early on between your email and talking with you how you've absorbed an identity of being jealous, Mm -hmm. how you've kind of self-defined in that way. I have felt that way very much before. And in hindsight, I have realized that I was being gaslit. I was kind of being manipulated because of some infidelity and other issues. So I want to explore that idea a little bit. April, did you flag that too? How do you feel? Well, yeah. I mean, I think if you are still experiencing the exact same traits that you did in a relationship when you were 17, we should talk about that. We should talk about when you do get insecure and jealous, what's happening? Like, who are you with? Is it just with men? Are you insecure and jealous with friends? Is that like a through line in your life? So we'd love to know where that started. Also, I don't like those sisters, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> not very nice. Yet. We have your back, <laughs> Vanessa. Not very nice. Yeah, they definitely created a lot of insecurities. And I feel like, you know, I was so mm. young. And then that was the story that I then continued on, you know, through my 20s and my 30s. And, you know, even now. But yes, so I feel that I used to get jealous if friends did find other friends and did things with them and not invite me or not include me. So yes, I don't think it was possessiveness like I did with my relationships. And what I think is that with my relationships, I feel like I have like attachment issues, right? And so if I fall in love with someone, I'm scared that they're going to leave me. And therefore I try to control my situations and I get worried like, well, I don't want this person to take you away from me. So I'm going to protect this. And how am I going to protect this? By me becoming jealous, by me checking your phone, by me, you know, and it's just... And with my first husband, I didn't think I was as controlling or jealous. But, you know, him and I still have a relationship because we have two boys. And um, he did share that, that I did show traits of me being that. And I think with him, it was because he was my security blanket and I was really scared to lose him. During that time, I wasn't working. I was working towards my career and he was the one taking care of me. So I was really scared to lose that. With my first marriage, you know, that I got married when I was 25. I had my son when I was 26. Then my next one when I was 28, 29. And we had this little home fairy tale, right? And I think for me, that's what I yearn for. I mean, I come from a Latino home where parents don't show very much affection. And I think looking back and through therapy, I realized that I'd been a sensitive child. I was a sensitive child. I'm a sensitive person. And I yearned for that. And so it was really, really tough 
to walk away from my first marriage. Um, everyone, my family, it's just friends did not think it was something that it was right to do, but I just couldn't be in a marriage anymore. I was raising three children, you know, and I just, I was overwhelmed. But with this one, I mean, he walked away and I just figured that was it. And I filed for divorce and I did everything else. But this one was really tough for me. Because he was the one who physically left and initiated it. I hope you don't view it as a personal rejection. And I think in that, those instances, people have a tendency to romanticize what they had. Yes, I find myself doing that a lot. Um, I think what it was is that he used the word toxic a lot. So then I started associating myself to being toxic. Um, I think I, I did get a little verbal abusive, not physically, but verbal, you know. Did you grow up with hot tempers in the house? Like, is that how people communicated? Yes, both my parents have hot tempers and it's just, it's really insane. My dad would be one that would just kind of take it, take it, take it. And then he would just explode. My mom just explodes right away. And I'm a combination of both. Like, depending on how you get me one day, I could be like, okay, okay. And then I explode or just react right away, you know? So yes, that was modeled a lot in my household. Yeah, you know, when your dad exploded and your mom exploded, regardless of when they did it, you know, on their own clock, whenever we explode and we get angry, it's always because we're hurting. We're in that sensitive state mm -hmm. and we're vulnerable and we don't know how to access it properly. Right. So out comes this like rage and then it's so off-putting and damaging to the people around us. Yes. But what it's really coming from is somebody that is just not being heard or seen or felt or acknowledged or loved, like, first and foremost, we all just have to look at each other instead of reacting to the lion roar roaring. And it's hard because not everybody's adept at this is to look at that person and go, you're not yelling at me. You know, yeah. this is you. Like, if we could just look past that, past the monster, we would see it's just this little tiny scared kid, you know, that just didn't get the warmth yeah. early on. That's hard because you said, Vanessa, you were born sensitive, right? I think I am, which is really funny because I find myself to be like this hard person, right? Like, but it's, yeah, I, I am. I'm very sensitive. I am very sensitive. The hardest people in the world are really sensitive. <laughs> Nobody knows it. Yeah. <laughs> you are sensitive, but your sensitivity is why you get loud and verbally abusive and why you go into jealousy and being possessive and insecure. It's because of your sensitivity. And that's your cover behavior of that. If you could just let yourself be the sensitive person and use your words and use your real feelings, mm -hmm. you would never get angry. You would never get possessive. And people around you would help you, right? You would say to them, I have this habit. I love you so much that I have a history of grabbing on real tight when it comes to me loving someone. And it's a pattern of mine. And I just need you to know that because it's, I just love you. So instead of saying, where have you been? It's like, I've missed you today, you know? Yeah. I need you. Like, that's the real stuff that's going on, which everybody's fine with. No one will ever think you're insecure because you're saying, I missed you. I love you. I'm thinking about you. It's all that other stuff that people do that breaks the relationships down. Well, right. And it's the negative tone, right? That you're, yeah. how it comes across and stuff like that. Well, the funny thing is that my ex-husband's from Spain and we had a long distance relationships for three years. We were married for one. So when he moved here, we got married and we started filing for, you know, paperwork. And I think everything just became really tough, you know, because it just didn't seem like my family accepted him. My friends didn't really think it was fair for me to be with someone because they seen my struggles and how hard I worked to get myself through school and where I'm at now, right? And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a high school counselor, so it's not like I'm making a lot of money, but, you know, it does require for you to have a master's degree to do that. And so, you know, I pushed myself through that. And so here I was supporting this man and it's not like he was just lazy, not doing anything at home, but he was working really hard for his career to kick off, right? And it was just never happened for him. And I would become overwhelmed because, I was working hard, yet I was paying all our bills. And then I had these two kids I had to support too, you know? And I just, there was a lot of overwhelming. I think there was resentment because the way that he would describe it was that it had to happen. Like I knew what I was getting myself into and this was just what it was going to be. So he was able to start working and contributing, right? And so it was just really hard because I started like, thinking all these negative thoughts. I'm like, okay, what am I being taken advantage of? Does he really love me? Like, I just doubted so much. 
So, you know, looking back, I don't know if it was really because it was just my insecurities and the lack of love for myself, or was it my intuition trying to tell me something, you know? So it's just something that's been really hard for me to work through. I haven't gone to therapy, but it's like, even then, you know, I just feel like there's just this thing that I just can't push away from. You know, I work privately with so many people that have said that they've worked with their counselor or their therapist for a long time and they're still not accessing it. And I think it's because there's not enough work done on soul traits and romantic value and like really taking time to kind of just do like logical strategy steps mm -hmm. to figure this stuff out. Because a lot of times if we're just reminiscing about the past and digging it up and it's like talking about our feelings, but there's no action. So I don't know if we can get it done in this call, but there's so much I want to help you with because I can feel you and you are so smart and you're a high school counselor, which means, you know, so many people rely on you and look to you and you've got your kids that are looking to you. And I can see why you'd be in a marriage and his career isn't taking off. And you've got all these responsibilities, not only in your job, but at home. And then you've got a guy whose career isn't taking off yet. And then you've got the family and the friends. I get why at some point you would be like, wait a minute, I'm hearing these people. And then it's like, now I don't trust my own voice. So is it fear and reality or is it intuition? Like, which is which? Yeah. And so there's exercises you can do to figure out if it's your intuition talking or if it's your fear. But then there's work that's done ahead of time to figure out how do you want to be valued in a relationship and what do you want to be valued and loved for, but those are like fun little exercises. I feel like you're so close because you intellectually get what's going on. And the fact that you want to take a break from dating is actually really smart because not only do you not want to do this to another person, right. but you don't want to do it to yourself because if you haven't figured this out yet, you are going to attract the wrong person. And then the cycle begins again. So it's okay to take a little bit of a break and start thinking about who you want to attract into your life. No one's going to ever make you feel secure and safe. You have to feel secure and safe. You have to know what's the difference between your fear and your intuition. And then what happens is you trust yourself the next time you meet someone. It's not about what he says or how many times a day he calls you or anything like that. It's really about, do I feel safe and secure with this person and why? Like really just like slowly, methodically figuring this stuff out. Like the rage that you have had is so clear to me because if you were this little girl that was born sensitive and you look to mom and dad to honor the sensitivity and they are not demonstrative with their hugs and kisses and love and words of affirmation for your sensitivity, you're going to be very confused in life because that wasn't highlighted or celebrated. So let's just figure that out so that you can gain some confidence and some security within yourself. And then let's get you out there eventually dating again. Yeah. I think trying to figure out where the relationship fell apart and why can be somewhat productive. But my personal philosophy is there are some clues that just in our relationships in our past that we will never be able to figure out. Right. I think you're right. Because... How can we not look to the past because it's the predictor of our future, right? So for better or worse, it does influence us. And every time we talk to someone, Vanessa, it always goes back to the very, very beginnings, you know, and not that we should lament or regret our childhoods or anything like that, but it's so part of it. And I think instead of saying, I wish I would have had it different, I'm more of a believer in it is what it is. And we all have a cross to bear in some area of our lives and something to work through. And that's the human experience, which is cool, right? This is just your thing. You excel at so many things. But this is the one thing that is holding you back from succeeding in all areas of your life. And what is so nice about you is you're so honest. You know, you even said the word abuse. So that tells me that you feel like your behavior has been abusive, but it's the four-year-old little girl. Yeah. You know, when you were a little girl at that age, if we were to ask you, what were you complimented for and what were you reprimanded for by your parents, what would you say? It seems like I was reprimanded more than complimented. At least that's what I remember. I remember I used to get punished a lot and it was because I was very active and I think both my parents couldn't handle that, right? And I have like this vivid 
story when I was maybe six or seven and it was summer and all the kids in our neighborhood were playing, but I was punished for something. So in order for me to bring all the kids near me, I started giving out Twinkies and all the kids started hanging out outside my door. And I was just like talking to them through my window. Right. <laughs> and I remember getting things so bad because oh. I was giving out our food, you know, and, and it's just, that story just always sticks with me because it kind of puts me in perspective, right? Like the type of person that I am where I'm like, okay, well, let me see if I can't go out there. Let me see how they could come here, right? But it always looked like a bad thing. It's interesting that you cite a story where you were feeling kind of euphoric and crafty (laughs) as a kid to an immediate, you know, witnessing your parents' anger. That is an interesting story because you have the two very strong emotional feelings right up against each other. Right, Anna. And she's euphoric. She's entrepreneurial. (laughs) She's crafty in this moment. She is a gatherer of people. She's insightful. And you think about this. All of that stuff is going on. She's lonesome because she's in her house and she's grounded. She wants to connect. So she's like, I know I will give treats. I will feed to gather people closer to me. So All of those traits make you who you are as a person, somebody who's in your career, all that stuff, right? And then you get punished and you get spanked. So it's like your natural rhythm of who you are got interrupted through a spank. Vanessa, has anybody ever told you you're too sensitive? My cousin, she tells me that I need to... Yeah, toughen up a little bit. <laughs> and Nobody should toughen up. There's no such thing as being too sensitive. It's just the people that get called too sensitive are because they're reactionary. They're very reactive to everything. That's not sensitivity. Sensitivity is an awareness of how you're feeling and how other people are feeling. So you read the room. That is primo sensitivity, not the where are you? What are you doing? Why didn't you invite me? And all of that jealousy, even with friends. That's you saying, I didn't get to be included. I wasn't loved, you know? If you were to go to your friends and say, you know, I felt hurt that I didn't get invited. Um, I'm feeling a little left out. If those friends aren't responsive to that, then you've cast the wrong friends into your life. And you also attracted two DJs. And DJs are out late at night. (laughs) They're in clubs. They're with a bunch of people. There's women. They're usually dressed really hot in the clubs. So you've Physically chosen people who are in an environment of nightlife, late nights, right? And you're a high school counselor. So your life is nine to five. You have children. Then you've got those high school kids that are about to try to go off to college. And there's all kinds of responsibility in your job during the day. And then you're choosing nightlife kind of people. So if you really want to feel secure, find your own security, but then also choose people who are really good at words of affirmation, who have lifestyles that support the kind of life that you are currently leading, right? That are really good communicators and that are direct with you. Because this guy, the one you were with, that you were married to, that just gave you an email and took off to his country, whether or not you felt like he was abused, he wasn't a communicator. He should have come to you and said, we're breaking apart. Like, This is no longer a situation I can do, and we're going to have to separate. It wouldn't have been in an email, right? So when somebody comes to you and says, you're hurting me, then your job is to say, okay, like, how can I not do this again? How can I just fall into this trust, right? Like, you've got to start choosing to trust. I love the idea of choosing to trust because I do think it can be kind of an act of choice to at least choose people that give you that freedom. See, and I feel for me, like I had options. The phone was left there. Do I choose to look or do I not? And I think I have OCD because I would fix it in wanting to find something. And I'm like, I'm going to find something. I know I am. Let me look. Let, you know, and it's like, I would never find anything. So then I would create stories like, well, maybe he's deleting things. Um, he's savvy with technology. So I know there's something going on. Like I would see myself in the mirror. Like it wasn't myself. And I remember... I met him two years after my first husband and I divorced and were separated. And, you know, I chose to dance salsa as my therapy. I felt healthy. Um, I was in the best shape of my life. And I just, I felt good going into this relationship. And at the end of it, I just, I seriously felt like the evil witch from Snow White. Like, it was just, that's who I would see in the mirror. And, you know, even he would tell me like, God, you know, when I met you, you had so much light. And now it's like, I don't, like, I just see like a cloud above you. And 
for me, I just, I don't know at what point it turned to that where so much doubt just started like taking over me. Had you been cheated on before? In my investigative <laughs> and checking phones back in 2000, uh, so I was with my high school sweetheart for seven years and um, we had decided to move up north and I then moved back to LA. And one day I just, I was sent to voicemail and I checked his voicemail and a girl left a message and said, hey, I'll be ready by five. You could come and pick me up. So I was like, what? I, I did not know like he was talking to anyone, right? I didn't even know he had friends up north. And so I called the number and the girl started laughing. And then she's like, yeah, you take it on with him. And so I was just really angry and I confronted him and he said he never, it wasn't cheating. It was just a friend that he had met at work. But I mean, to this day, I feel like it's still questionable. And I don't know if I've been cheated on, right? So that's where I'm at with that. <laughs> so because we focused a lot on your temper and jealousy, but there is a world where you're also being gaslit, maybe. Maybe, yeah. If you have those elements in you, they can sure easily be fertilized by someone Accusing you of being crazy, accusing you of being really jealous, accusing, you know, like that's been my experience. <laughs> <laughs> but her last husband wasn't doing anything and she found nothing, you know, and he was just getting pummeled underneath that. So to you, your modeling is love is scarce. Love is explosive. Love is angry. Love isn't safe. So when he said, what happened to you? When I met you, you had so much light. It's because you weren't in love yet. You weren't invested. Once your love deepened, your fear and scarcity increased. And so your behavior followed. And that's exactly what happened. Damn, April. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're acknowledging this and you're wanting to work on it is so, so big. And so this is your time to fix it by staying in the sensitivity and the awareness and the vulnerability. It's not about should I look at the phone or not? It's I love this person and loving this person means trusting this person. And when you're trying to check phones and drawers and calling people and driving by a house, that's a lack of vulnerability because you're so fearful that somebody's going to dupe you, trick you, lie to you. So you're doing everything, all the work in advance to make sure that you never get your heart broken. And what's happening is you're actually, in effect, breaking your own heart. So forget about the phone, all that. I can't tell you to trust people. It's just trust in what love is. And then if someday you get cheated on or lied to, you can say, you know what? It happened to me. I'm hurt. I was fully present in that relationship. And I, this still happened to me. But at least you'll know that you gave your all, that you were there and you were at your best. And then it's easier to heal the reason why you're not healed from this isn't just because you have a divorce. It's because you're afraid it's going to happen again and you feel that you created the demise of your marriage. Yeah, it's exactly like in a nutshell how I'm feeling. And that's why I am scared. I'm scared to even like go out there and I don't know. You're on your road for sure. But, you know, the thing I don't like about people when they come to me for dating and most of my job when I'm when I'm in the matchmaking arena is so hard because if people haven't done the work, then they come to me and they sign a contract and they hire us and then they say, find me the love of my life. And I'm not saying love is for the perfect because it's not, trust me. But what happens is I have clients, they haven't done any self-awareness work. They haven't figured it out. So when I give them advice or guidance or perspective, they push on me so hard and then they expect something that isn't coming to them, right? It's not going to arrive. Or people that go on dating apps because they're lonely, you know, and they want to fill the, the void. And then they're basically putting all their stuff on other people. And then those people get hurt. And then they have patterns going forward. So if everybody just had the guts to say, I'm just going to be alone for a year and work on this, trust me, they will come. And you won't feel like you wasted the year. Because I think this is the time, since you have had two marriages, for this new decade of your life is to say, I'm going to spend 12 months doing a deeper dive and figuring this out and getting every book I can get my hands on and working with my therapist or a coach or whatever you need to do. Because it's hard to grow when you're in a relationship. It's hard to fix this stuff. So I wouldn't want you going out on dating right now. Okay. 
I just want to make sure that you build your foundation so that when you do date, you're dating really smart, right? you know, and that you're attracting good, safe, honorable, amazing guys, and that you finally fall in love with that sensitive little girl that stood out her window and gave Twinkies to all of her friends because she wanted people around her. You know, that's that's your true essence. That's who you are. You're not the the wicked witch in the mirror that you saw the other day. And the reason why you see that is because that's like the the shadow of you. But it's not the real you. The real you is the generous one, the Twinkie girl. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so helpful and amazing that you recognize what you brought to the table in your relationship, for better or for worse. You know, it's so funny. Just the other day, I was feeling lonely. And it, I thought I was going through a depressive moment. So I just grabbed my journal. I'm like, okay, is this really depression? Am I really down? But I was just laying in bed and I did not want to get out of bed. And so after like I journaled a little, I'm like, okay, I got to get my day going, you know, and I just started cleaning my room. And then I called my kids to see what they were doing. So I went over there and somehow cleaning has become my therapy too. And so I was cleaning and it got me out of my funk. But yeah, it was the idea. I was feeling lonely. I wanted that cuddle with someone or I wanted to like just sit down and watch a movie with someone. And it's just... And that loneliness too opens the door for that self-critique and reflection on the past, which should only be opened every once in a while, I think. Yeah. I mean, I want you to be able to look forward to the best decade of your life. I want you to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish, you know, and focus on those goals. A lot of us distract from our growth because when we're in the growth feeling, we think it's depression. So we're like, I got to get out of this funk. I got to go clean the house. I got to go call a friend. I got to go have a drink. And then we don't grow. That weighted feeling that you had when you were in bed was your body's way of saying, stay in bed, think, feel, process. It's not depression. You're feeling something. We just think it's depression. So what we do is we try to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And then we short circuit whatever it is that we're going for. So next time, honor yourself. Stay journaling. Stay in bed. That's when you're that vulnerable person who's going to find the answers. So that's the rhythm and the where you want to be, Vanessa, is just trusting your words and knowing like you're so educated and smart and experienced in relationship. I mean, really, instead of saying I've got two divorces under my belt, please never say that phrase again. Take that out of your vocabulary today. It doesn't sound great. It doesn't feel great. It's not true. Two divorces under my belt is so dismissive of your journey. This is good advice for me too, April. <laughs> well, you have said that, Anna. But at some point, Anna, like we, we have to get over that and we have to reframe by saying, I am such a person who wants connection that I have swung the bat twice. And this isn't about putting a pretty picture on it. This is the truth. Mm -hmm. It's like whatever we're saying, is it helpful or is it destructive? I would rather go with the framing that makes me feel like it's helping me. Right. No one has baggage. Nobody's got two divorces under their belt. We all need to stop this. I look at you and I see somebody who knows how to go for stuff. I see somebody that commits. I see somebody that commits to her education, commits to her children, commits to marriage. Commits to cleaning. <laughs> commits to cleaning. <laughs> That's what I see, right? So why hurt yourself? Because no one's going to love your story if you don't love it. Right. No one. No one. you got to start by loving your own story. And like, you know what? I love connection and love and commitment so much that I was so invested in that. But I've now realized that I what I really needed to do is take some time out for myself and really grow and learn and, and learn from my experiences and not blame myself, but really take responsibility for my behavior and my choices. And I wanted to heal before I ever committed again. And there's not a guy in the world who's worthy of you that would think poorly of you for that if you know how to articulate it. Right. Because it's how you tell your story. It's not your story. And you know what's so impressive too is that you are not a victim and that's maybe to a fault, but I think it's such a rare and incredible quality and very admirable. Thank you. Yeah. And by the way, when you say that, that clearly, no one pokes at you. It's the craziest thing yeah. on dates. Like <clears throat> when you know your story, love your story, then you look back and you're like, so Mark, you know, what's your story? Like they don't go, well, wait a minute. I want to know. They're not saying, you know, whoa, she's the girl that can't stay married. They're not saying that. They just know, hmm, she got married 
before she had enough self-knowledge to make sure she was doing it the right way with the right person. And that's really it. Yeah. Like, who cares? Again, you swung the bet. Yeah. <laughs> I like it when people have seasoning and growth through relationship. And I don't look at divorce as failure. I just look at it as chapters and people who wanted to try, wanted to try it love. And they just didn't give themselves enough time and knowledge to be single. Because I truly believe in our 20s and 30s, that is the biggest time of growth. And if you get married too soon, you kind of short circuit that. That's all. So you don't really learn. When my high school sweetheart and I broke up, I dove into school. That was my focus, school, school, school. Then after my first husband and I got divorced, I dove into salsa dancing. And that was just everything for me, right? And then now I've learned that I didn't heal from any of those relationships. And those have been my big relationships, right? And for me. So this time around, it's really learning about myself more, about my values. I don't think I even considered that when I was looking for my dates or men. I think anyone that would give me attention is where I went to, right? Whereas now it's like, I value education. Neither of my husbands mm -hmm. went to school. Uh -huh. You know, I, I value spirituality. Neither of my husbands are into that, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so I feel like those are two things that now I really need to concentrate on and, and really focus. And I'm hoping, you know, that if I, someone does come my way, but it's like that, it's what you're saying, like what you attract. I mean, I hope this doesn't go on, but just recently, you know, I was out with a few friends and, and we were drinking and I don't know what came over me. This guy walked by and I grabbed his butt. Okay. So then the guy turned around and he was like, what? So full on make on session, he ended up coming to my place and you know, it's, it happened continuously right after two years of like not doing anything. So I was like, okay, let's have fun. Um, but then he shared a little bit about his story and sure enough, he's damaged. And I'm like, great. Like where, what, you know, like I didn't expect anything to come out of that scenario, but it's just, it's still, I'm still attracting like. Well, Vanessa, you're grabbing at love, literally. Like, you grabbed the guy's butt in a bar. <laughs> I mean, come on. What are you doing? I mean, come on. Vanessa, never, ever do that again. I'm okay, sorry. I won't, I won't. I'm sorry. I'm going to go into learned. mom role. Because it's not feminine. It's not receptive. You know, the receptive feminine woman sees a cute guy walking across a bar and lights up and sits there and just, like, holds space and just understands that she's beautiful and if it's meant to be he will walk over you grabbing it it says so much about you and when you bring a guy back to your house while you're in this development stage you might think it's lightweight and fun and playful and sex and okay cool but it's hurting you more because at 40 you have to start dating differently you have to like you said start dating with your current value set those kinds of things. So therefore, in your 40s, you can't date like you did when you were 20. Right. And if you don't have the validation of what your romantic value is, every time a guy gives you any kind of physical attention or verbal attention, you're going to think he's your answer. Right, right. And it has, it has brought me back into this little slump, you know, and I think that's why maybe I've been feeling the way I have in the past week where I just, you know, I just feel... Ugh. Yeah, because you're finally sitting at home by yourself. Right. But I'm just telling you, the answers will come, but you keep distracting. And I love that you love salsa, but even that was a distraction at some point. Yeah. Having sex with a random guy at a bar, the salsa dancing, the cleaning the kitchen, the cleaning the house. It's all distraction. Everything is getting in your way because you don't want to feel that feeling. But if you do, the answers will come. You just have to kind of get through that tunnel and stay in that for a little while. And don't think it's depression. It's not. Okay. It's just process. Okay. I like that. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for sharing all this very, very relatable stuff. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Like, honestly, the reason, the only reason why I'm talking to you like this is because I know how strong you are. April does not pull any punches. <laughs> Thank you so much for both your time. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Vanessa. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye.